Although it had taken America considerable time to get into the action since her declaration of war, the first few months of the new year had witnessed a flood of men and materials arriving at the docks of England and France. The fresh troops of the American Expeditionary Forces, eager to deliver the final blow to the haggard German army, poured off their ships and under the command of General Blackjack Pershing were moved into position along the front. Manpower was the one thing the United States offered vast quantities of, and before it was all finished, nearly two million Americans would have sailed to Europe to join the fight. The United States wartime industrial output, however, fell woefully short of her boasts of the previous year. Where 23,000 tanks had been ordered from American factories, scarcely two dozen had been completed by the war's end. Likewise, only 130 artillery pieces of the 2,000 used by the American forces had been produced in the United States. The lack of American-built airplanes was to be a source of great embarrassment to the politicians at home who boasted that 20,000 American-built machines would darken the skies over Europe. In truth, not a single American-designed airplane was to see service in France. Operating under license from the British de Havilland Company, American firms did, however, turn out a number of DH-4 bombers powered by Detroit's Liberty engine. There was no shortage of Americans volunteering for service in aviation. By October of 1917, some 7,000 cadets had entered ground schools in the States, and 500 of them had actually completed flight training. Unfortunately, any flight training the cadets received were on antique types, including the slow-moving Curtis Jenny, and the new flyers were considered far from qualified to join in the Great Air War. Upon their arrival in France, they would have to be further trained to fly the modern airplanes the American Air Service was beginning to procure from the French. A large training school was set up at Issoudan for the purpose of introducing the incoming American flyers to the various French machines. Whereas Isudan had originally been conceived as an advanced training school only, it was soon expanded to include primary training and would eventually cover 50 square miles of land and comprise a dozen separate airfields. Ever since America's entry into the war, it had been assumed that the volunteers who'd been serving in the air forces of Britain and France would be absorbed into the new U.S. Air Service. The Lafayette Flying Corps, its ranks by now swelled to hundreds of members, would offer a pool of experienced combat veterans for the American service to draw upon. In January, the transfer began, and both the Lafayette Escadrille and the Lafayette Flying Corps ceased to be. Raoul Lufberry, the most celebrated of the Lafayette Flyers, with 17 victories, was commissioned a major in the United States Air Service and informed that he would be given one of the new American squadrons. Unfortunately, as Lufberry learned, the squadron existed on paper only, and in the meantime he was sent to Isudan, where he found himself anchored to a desk and buried under a mountain of paperwork. 